So I'll be talking about how an anthropological approach to these matters, to, to uh, political movements, to protest, uh, normally, or often, um, what we try and do is follow the conflict, um, see where it takes us, which, which can be quite puzzling or baffling to people sometimes from other disciplines who find it uh, a bit of an un untidy, too open-ended approach, but we generally like it that way, and uh, we often do that. We, we follow the conflict as it unfolds. Then I'll be talking about uh, particip participatory media research. Uh, it's, we have um, great opportunities these days to uh, um, do the sort of research that we do anthropologically normally anyway, participant observation. Um, now, participant observation takes on many different f forms, particularly through social media and those media platforms that encourage participation. So I'll be talking briefly about uh, how we do participatory media research. Then I'll talk about the folk categories, particularly political categories, that um, an anthropological approach that anthropologists generally look at. We, we often go to the field not quite knowing um, what the key concepts, what the actual focus of the research will be. We, we decide that in the field generally. And we tend to try and understand the emic, the folk categories, political categories that people are using. Uh, nowadays, in the kind of social movement that we're seeing, uh, that we've seen since last year, uh, there's a renewed interest in networks, in the, in the possibility of uh, horizontal networks and decentralization and so on, that, uh, how, how they supposedly enable uh, new forms of political participation. So an anthropological, uh, anthropo anthropological approach would take uh, these categories, would, would take a notion such as networks as, quite, as being quite a problematic uh, notion in need of um, investigation. And I'll end by discussing um, how we go about uh, comparing what normally is, is quite an open-ended fieldwork process, uh, what happens at the, at the end of that process, how do you compare your findings on uh, political mobilizations and media, how do you compare those findings which can be quite unique and that you haven't often anticipated with, with other case studies, with other cases um, that may may be comparable. Right, so, as I was saying earlier, my own approach to um, the study of uh, politics, uh, mediated politics, has been inspired by the Manchester School of Anthropology. Uh, many of you will know uh, names such as uh, Gluckman, Victor Turner, Epstein, and so on. This goes back to the 1940s, 1950s, where they encountered conditions of rapid social change on the ground in, uh, in southern and central Africa. And uh, there was a lot of conceptual innovation going on in that period, particularly in the 1950s, when older forms of trying to understand what was going on on the ground uh, didn't quite work. You know, static notions such as tribe, more bounded notions didn't work. So um, some of those terms, that, uh, that those concepts that were coined in that encounter uh, include the notion of social drama, uh, processional form as well, which uh, I'm, I'll be using in, in this talk. Uh, the idea of the processional form is that uh, when you follow the conflict, you try to understand it as a process that may exceed the bounds of the political field that you're studying. So you may start off within a, a, a given political field, but the conflict will often take you away from that initial uh, uh, field base, and um, you, the idea is to try and sta study that process um, in, in stages, try and um, understand it uh, in a, if you like, in a developmental way. Um, I'm not claiming any special originality here in this regard. Mo a lot of mobilization, political mobilization approaches, of course, adopt a processual 
form. But I suppose what I'm suggesting is that in a lot of the Twitter revolution polemics that we've had since 2009 and more recently since uh, 2011, many of the debates are in focusing on whether or not this is a new phenomenon, whether or not Twitter or Facebook or social media have played uh, a crucial role, we very often end up neglecting the processual, the stage-by-stage -stage dimension of uh, the media scape. And uh, the key point I'm making is that uh, each stage of that political conflict will have its own media scape, which will be quite distinctive from uh, the other stages of that process. Right, so very briefly, I'd like to start with um, my previous research in suburban Malaysia, where I was looking at um, residential politics in a middle-class suburb uh, outside uh, Kuala Lumpur. And one of the concepts that I used from Victor Turner, the very well-known concept of the social drama. A social drama is a political conflict in which there is a breach of the established order, um, then there is a crisis uh, that follows that breach, that, or that perceived breach, uh, usually by a leading um, politician, by a, lead, uh, a local leader. Then there is a, a process of redress, that, 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 that critical uh, stage, or that, that phase, uh, the, 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 the original breach has to be redressed through uh, redressive action, and at the end of that process, of that drama, uh, there is either a reintegration of the, uh, of the parties that are in that dispute, or there's a, sch there's a schism, they go their own separate ways. Now, in my own research in uh, Malaysia, I found that um, both internet and mobile media shaped the dramas that, um, uh, that unfolded within those particular conflicts, very much at a, uh, at a local level. The other thing that I did in that Malaysian research um, when it came to writing up and analysing those, those uh, findings was to try and avoid what I now call the community <coughs> and network conceptual trap that lies uh, within internet studies. Uh, and by this I mean um, over-reliance uh, in new media studies generally uh, on the two or three key concepts such as community, network or public sphere that, um, uh, as I see it, blinker or limit our understanding of what invariably is a much more complex uh, political and techno-political landscape. So what I'm advocating is, is not that we do away with the notion of community or that we get rid of network, I'm advocating more conceptual vocabulary. I'm advocating let's not reduce <coughs> the tremendous flux and complexity that we find on the ground to whether or not we can see the emergence of a community. Right, very briefly, that was the research setting. My field work was a long time ago, if you remember, you know, the days before YouTube, the days before Facebook, uh, 2003, 2004, a very long time ago. But I also stretched it out, uh, not content with that particular historical moment. Uh, when I came back from the field uh, to the UK, I carried on online, and I also paid a short visit in 2010. So I tried to um, look at this period uh, diachronically through what we might call diachronic ethnography, trying to stretch out the ethnographic moment. So that's the um, leafy suburb, uh, middle class, middle income suburb uh, outside Kuala Lumpur. But not all is well with the suburb when um, mostly ethnic Chinese middle class residents moved in. They realized that not everything was as nice as they, they were buying into, but what they, th they, they thought they could expect, expect from us, you know, from a relatively upmarket up um, suburb. That's um, the commercial area, one of the local mosques, and the municipal council. As you probably know, Malaysia is um, quite
quite strongly segregated along <laughs> ethno-religious lines. So the result is that in this ethnic Chinese majority um, township, the municipal council, the local authorities, are over 90% Malay and Muslim. So there's, there's a tremendous imbalance in, in how local government is run. There are no local go uh, government elections. They were abol uh, sorry, abolished in the late 1960s. The town council in Subang Jaya has promoted, or used to promote, back then, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, a cyber vision for the locality. They wanted to be, the idea was to become almost a laboratory of um, electronic governance, of good governance through the internet, and, and to be ahead of the rest of <coughs> Malaysian municipalities. Now, what happened was that that contrast between the expected leafy suburb and the realities of traffic jams, of, um, of lack of local schools, of, of problems with rubbish disposal, what you might regard as mundane issues, what an ur urban intellectual might regard as, as a mundane, uh, mundane issues. Um, sorry, I'm sorry about that. Uh, they were taken very seriously indeed by leading residents. So the result of that was the emergence of what I call banal activism, uh, an activism that revolves around these mundane issues such as traffic jams and rubbish disposal and so on, uh, with its internet, very strong internet uh, dimension. This is an example of um, um, citizen journalism, uh, a local community web forum in which the citizen journalists very um, openly um, attacks the local council for its uh, uh, lack of action on an issue. Now, um, an example of this activism was a social drama that revolved around the building of a police station. Local people in this um, crime-ridden suburb had been demanding better security. They thought that the state surveillance wasn't quite enough, good enough. So it wasn't one of these cases of activists not wanting all that state surveillance. They, they wanted more state surveillance. Um, but uh, there was a rumor that the local council had um, given this land that had been earmarked for a police station to, um, to, um, for, for private, for private uh, gain. Uh, there were rumors about um, uh, corruption to do with this case. Uh, so the result was an unfolding social drama that uh, where uh, local activists used the internet, they, looked, they used uh, mobile phones, to finally um, demonstrate in front of the uh, in front of national TV and the national press. It was a success. It was small scale, but for a country with a tradition of authoritarian government. Um, this was quite a success for the, for the local activists. Um, it was small scale, you could, um, it was manageable as a research project. Uh, which brings me nicely, I hope, to the Spanish case, which is far from small scale and um, uh, has become quite, uh, not just for me, but for all of us involved with these issues, um, quite, quite an, a challenge to... to um, um, undertake research into these um, these developments. So my case study uh, refers to um, not to suburban Malaysia in this case, but to urban Spain, and uh, that's the period I'm covering, uh, which coincides with my fieldwork in in Spain. Now, back in 2004. Uh, if, if we had a time traveller from 2004 and they looked at this diagram, the social media landscape in 2011, uh, regardless of what you think of this diagram, whether you think it's, um, it's, um, it portrays accurately what's happening, uh, it gives you an idea of the tremendous 
diversity of uh, social media platforms that we have today. Uh, in the case of um, the uh, Spanish Indignados movement, I would probably place Twitter very much at the heart of um, how people map, how activists map the social media landscape. Um, but this gives us an idea of, of, of um, the uh, tremendous changes that we've seen in terms of the expansion and the diversification of uh, media platforms from only five, six, seven years ago. Right, so um, my research in, uh, in Catalonia took place from July 2010 to July 2011 uh, for 12 months and uh, I was based at the IN3, uh, Open University in uh, uh, Catalonia, which is a research centre on the internet um, run by uh, Manuel Castells. Now, I went there with quite an open agenda. The idea was to um, study what part, if any significant part, social media were playing in, in the activities of Barcelona-based activists. So, so the idea was to map out the locality, find out whether Facebook, Twitter, YouTube and, and similar platforms were making any significant difference to uh, the work of local activists. Um, now, when I arrived, the big issue was, uh, was the bullfighting ban. Um, as many of you will know, uh, will know um, animal rights activists have finally managed in the region of Catalonia to um, uh, have the bullfighting, uh, the bullfight banned. So that was uh, a success that in fact uh, took place with very little social media use. They used much more traditional means. Uh, signatures were very important, for example. Um, mobile phones, not necessarily smartphones, were important as well. Um, and the other issue was uh, uh, a resurgence of, of nationalist protests against the, uh, the Constitutional Court in Madrid for downgrading, if you like, uh, Catalonia status um, within the Spanish Kingdom. Now, what I didn't really expect was the Spanish Revolution. Nobody expects the Spanish Revolution, especially in Catalonia. Um, I, I wasn't there to study Spain. I, I, I expected to be um, entangled in, in nationalist uh, uh, politics at the regional level. But what happened um, from the beginning of, yeah, from early 2011, from February, March, April, um, the energies were focused on building up towards the 15th of May um, demonstrations across Spain. And uh, without an having anticipated it, I ended up, like many of my colleagues who were doing other things, what, what's interesting about these kinds of phenomena is that researchers and scholars who are doing other things, when something so big happens, uh, <laughs> you end up all working on on the same on the same issue. So it, it brings uh, not not only citizens together, but it brings uh, our researchers and scholars together as well. Now this is the backdrop to the situation, uh, a, a dire economic situation. Uh, you could call it una época de toros flacos, as opposed to toros gordos. Uh, it, it's a it's a very it's a dire Mm. Spain, as, as you know, as, as other countries, is, is going through very harsh economic times. There's a very high um, percentage of uh, unemployment, over 45% uh, for young people. Um, and uh, that says, um, come out to the street to demonstrate on, on the 19th. Against this backdrop of, um, of unemployment, of lack of opportunities, uh, particularly for, for young university educated uh, people, but throughout the economy, um, emerged the 15th of May movement, what we now know as the 15th 
of May movement. So, following that um, processual approach that I mentioned at the outset, what I'd like to suggest is that um, it would be helpful to uh, try and divide up the, uh, the movement into stages and look at the various mediascapes at different stages of this protest movement. So, the working division that I'm proposing here is uh, one that starts in the pre-encampments, pre-acampadas period that um, goes from roughly early February to the 15th of May when uh, protests, were, um, protests took place across uh, many cities of Spain. This uh, period was built up this, uh, there was a build-up period uh, that took place to a large extent through the internet. And I'll talk about this more in a moment. There are also, of course, face-to-face -face meetings. And there was a period in which new political platforms, uh, a whole range of new platforms, were created uh, around specific issues, such as evictions or the lack of future for young people or... Um, a campaign against the main political parties. But these coalesce around the idea that on the 15th of May there would be a day of protest. Um, and around the slogan, real democracy now. Democracia real ya. Real democracy now. Then we have the roughly four week period of the encampments when people occupied public squares throughout uh, the main cities of Spain. This period was a period of, a, of an explosion of media coverage, not just mass mainstream media, but it was, it was a period in which a whole host of, um, of media technologies were used. And it was a period of mass gatherings where the, the focus was very much on these public spaces uh, assemblies were set up, and um, there was tremendous interest uh, for most of this period from the mainstream media. And then the period we find ourselves in now uh, is what we might call the post acampadas the post-encampments period, that roughly starts on the 12th of June. I've, I've chosen this date because that's when the, perhaps the main uh, encampment at Puerta del Sol in Madrid that's when it was disbanded, and uh, people moved from the, the central squares, they moved to the neighbourhoods, so they set up local groups, local assemblies, in, in, uh, at, the, at the local level, at the neighbourhood level. Since then, we've had um, intermittent or episodic mainstream media attention, and um, arguably the movement has gone global through uh, the Occupy movement and similar developments in other parts of the world. So let's talk about the pre acampadas period first. There's an internet build-up and, uh, well, to give it a personal twist, um, I arrived in July uh, 2010 in Barcelona and until December, really, I have to be honest with you, until December, I hadn't quite found enough people to work with. I, um, I was finding the activist landscape in Barcelona too fragmented. Uh, it was only in, in December that not just me, but uh, people interested in politics, in activism, that if you like, we found one another, and it happened um, one of the key arenas, I don't want to say it was the only key arena, but one of the key arenas was Twitter. Um, like me, other people f have found the microblogging site Twitter to be, be very useful as a way uh, of, as they say on Twitter, following your own interests. Uh, literally, you can, you can find people, follow them via Twitter, and it's become a very important arena, among other things, to navigate uh, what invariably is, is a complex uh, political landscape. But there are other arenas as well. This was an online mobilization 
against an anti-digital piracy bill, the so-called Sinde law, La Ley Sinde, which was introduced um, to allegedly, or ostensibly, to try and curtail the Spanish passion for illegal downloading of copyrighted materials. Now, uh, internet activists suspected that uh, Uncle Sam, that the State Department had been leaning on the Spanish government, and this was confirmed by WikiLeaks um, in November. So we have the convergence of, um, of questions to do with um, local politics and uh, the WikiLeaks episode, which confirmed um, that there was, at least to the, from the activist perspective, a conspiracy uh, against the, the population. Uh, but other site, important sites were these link sharing sites um, where um, the copyrighted content can be shared. The Spanish Parliament, so there was a small physical demonstration protest um, in front of the Spanish Parliament, and obviously within the Spanish Parliament, uh, the, uh, the proposed bill was debated. The mainstream media followed the episode with interest, and um, they followed Twitter for the, one of the first times. Uh, the, um, the mainstream media, such as na national TV in Spain, followed what these activists, what activists were saying on Twitter. Not just activists, but also celebrities, personalities from both sides of the debate. That was covered uh, in quite some detail by the mainstream media. Now, when the, the ruling parties, the popular parties, the uh, Partido Socialista, PSOE, Convergencia Union, when the main political parties went ahead despite the outcry and passed the bill, this is when new protest, um, the new protest platform, uh, Noles Votis, Don't vote for them. Knowledge voters. That was created as a reaction to the passing of this of this bill. The what the activists were saying, what these internet activists were saying, was that this came to demonstrate once again that the political <coughs> class had no interest in in serving the the the, the needs of the population and that they would push ahead with their own, um, their own interest in, in, in anyway. But other platforms were created around then, early 2011, coinciding with the Arab Spring, the, the, with events in Tunisia and Egypt, uh, platforms such as Youth Without a Future, the unwell, Unwelfare State um, in Estado del Malestar, uh, Real Democracy Now, and so on. It was Real Democracy Now, DRY, that coordinated the 15th of May demonstrations across 59 cities. Now, the Lei Sinde episode in late 2010 was a social drama, I would argue, that ended in a schism between leading internet activists and the political class. And as I was pointing out earlier, led in turn to the creation of the Knowledge About This platform. I'm using the Twitter hashtags to indicate the importance of Twitter to uh, launch these platforms and get people on board. But I don't want to say by this, uh, I have to stress this point, that Twitter was the only game in town. There are many other uh, technologies and uh, internet platforms being used. So, as I'm, as, as I'm pointing out, it was, don't vote for the main parties. It was not, as reported by the New York Times, it was not, do not vote, don't vote. It was, don't vote for the main parties. Vote, do whatever you like, but don't vote for the main parties. Uh, now, the Lay Sende campaign and the other platforms led to the emergence of a very strange bedfellowship of uh, bloggers, microbloggers, hackers, technopreneurs, lawyers, and students. Until then, and this is why I was struggling in the early days of my fieldwork, 
people were doing their own thing. Uh, you had students, you had the nationalists, uh, you had the technopreneurs. Everybody was doing their own thing. It's only now, in early 2011, partly inspired by the Arab Spring, but also inspired by Iceland, by, by the popular revolt in Iceland against um, their own government and against their own uh, financial class, that suddenly you get all these very different people collaborating, sharing hashtags, retweeting hashtags, but also meeting face-to-face -face using Facebook, uh, blogs, a whole range of different, uh, different platforms. So, to continue with the pre-encampment period, just to give you a, a slight zooming into uh, the more local level of Barcelona, uh, real democracy now in Barcelona, before the 15th of May protests, used, uh, among other forms of communication, face-to-face -face meetings, there was a mailing list, Facebook group, a web forum, Twitter hashtags, and there was some mainstream media coverage, um, not a great deal. There was no media blackout. Uh, there are often complaints uh, that the ma mainstream media have imposed or imposed a blackout of what was going on. Not really. There was media coverage, but not an enormous amount. Now, Twitter hashtags are very interesting. Uh, activists have learned, particularly the, uh, real democracy now activists, learned fairly quickly how to play the algorithm, if you like, how to change the keywords uh, on a regular basis so that that uh, particular keyword, that hashtag would trend, would be one of the trending topics on, uh, on Twitter and therefore uh, would reach the campaign, the protest would reach a wider audience. Um, as, as most of you will know, Twitter does not there's a ranking of the trending topics, and that's not by sheer volume, it's by the novelty, by the rise in, in the novelty of a keyword, and old hashtags get deselected. You, you need to come up with new keywords uh, in order to make it to that, that uh, top list of, um, of, tw of, uh, of keywords. Right, so moving very briskly to the uh, acampadas themselves, This is a photo from Santiago in the northwest. This is Madrid, uh, the central square, Puerta del Sol, where all the road system in Spain starts, the symbolic heart of uh, centralized Spain. <coughs> and uh, a journalist with El País, Elola, described the, uh, what happened on the 17th of May as, as follows. Tuesday the 17th was magical. Magical because nothing had been prepared. Fed by social networks, a spontaneous demonstration bloomed into existence. The 15th M protest, by contrast, had been the fruit of conscious and conscientious labor, three months of preparation. Tuesday was something else, something new, something different. Now, uh, you will probably know this story, but I'll, I'll tell it anyway. The 15th of May protests were supposed to be... The idea was that the general public would protest against the domination of politicians and bankers and for real democracy. What nobody, or very few people, really had anticipated is that some people would actually stay on uh, at the Puerta del Sol, at the main square in Madrid. Um, they decided to set up camp. Uh, a pioneering group of 30 to 40 people set up camp that night and they stayed on. I witnessed this from Barcelona. I, through the Facebook group, <coughs> what became apparent very quickly is that the organizers of the demos of 15th of May didn't know what to do about this because that wasn't really part of the script. Um, so it created an entire new um, quality to the to the the political conflict, and um, it was as someone described almost like passing the baton. It was a new wave of people 
who came in and um, occupied the square, set up these encampments, uh, is a very different dynamic. It was uh, largely spontaneous and very rapid. Within a period of three or four days, the, the squares were occupied. And this is a photo from the uh, Plaza de Catalunya in Barcelona. There's a diagram there of how the, the square works. Iceland takes pride of place. There's an area uh, dedicated to Iceland. There's Tahrir Square up here. Tahrir Palestine. Uh, an anomaly there. You don't normally uh, hear much about Palestine, in my experience, in this kind of... in, in, in the movement. And the various committees dedicated specialising in issues such as education, health, uh, communication with the press, etc. So the square became uh, almost like a city within a city where direct democracy was being practiced. Someone compared it to Speaker's Corner initially. Um, it was a place, an agora, the idea is that you go, anyone, any member of the public can go there and engage in discussions about how to fix the dire situation, the dire state of, of, of Spanish, so-called Spanish democracy. This is an example from um, Puerto del Sol, the representatives uh, from Barcelona, and there's a lot of non-verbal language which was not obviously invented here. Some people have claimed this has a longer history in the anti-corporate globalization movement. But what is true is that is the mainstreaming of this uh, non-verbal language. Uh, until then, very few people, unless you were part of those activist circles, people didn't, um, were not familiar with the dynamics of an assembly uh, or the dynamics of experimenting with direct democracy. And there were lots of slogans supported, in this case, not by digital technologies, but by analog technologies. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of um, inventiveness with uh, new slogans. Um, this one here is quite, quite nice. No hay pan para tanto, pa tanto chorizo. There's not enough bread for the chorizo we've got. Chorizo is another word for thief. It's a slang word for thief. So... We haven't got enough bread for all these politicians who are, and bankers. It's politicians and bankers that people single out. Um, <coughs> no somos anti-sistema. We're not anti-system. The system is anti-us. Lots of inventive, wonderful uh, uh, creativity. A colleague of mine, uh, Enrique Senabra, has compared this to, to tweets, uh, posted tweets. Uh, where you can leave short messages, slogans, with, your, with hashtags, uh, if you like. And just to give you a sample of the tremendous diversity of media technologies used, which is why we are suffering with this. We need all the help we can get to try and make sense of, of this, this particular period. This is just some examples of the media technologies used. There were web forums, blogs, collaborative documents, uh, for example, manifestos, press releases, pedagogical materials on how the Spanish electoral system works, uh, analogic versions of digital media forms, what we just saw, the post-it tweets, cartoons, online and offline, radio phone-ins, phone citizen photography, it could go, the list could go on and on and on. This is just, uh, it's not a complete inventory, of course. It's just a compilation of, uh, from some of the sources there. Video clips, live streaming, aggregators, uh, and then some social media platforms such as Facebook uh, and Twitter. Right, so how do we make sense of this, uh, this huge um, uh, surge in, in media engagement and not just in media consumption but in media production both by professionals and non-professionals. Well, some, this is one, one attempt at just covering the, how the newspapers, mm, the main newspapers covered the event. As you can see, that 17th of May which 
we earlier described as a, as a magical day, was hardly covered, uh, didn't make it to the front page of uh, main newspapers such as El Mundo or La Vanguardia. It's only really from the 19th of May onwards that uh, the protests that the um, Occupy Squares take centre stage. Um, the, I if I remember correctly, it was the Washington Post that covered, the, the first major newspaper to cover the, the events in Spain was the Washington Post. Now, uh, there was an enormous amount of uh, Twitter activity to do with, um, with the protest. This is a study by a, a team of um, uh, researchers in, in Zaragoza. There was, uh, they've uh, analyzed the tweeting behavior of nearly 90,000 us users sending over half a million protest messages within a 30-day period. What they found is that by the end of this period, most users had sent one or more messages about protests, about the protests, and only two remained silent. So there's a very small minority of lurkers who were following events uh, on Twitter, uh, but most people, at the very least, created their own message uh, about the protests or retweeted somebody else's message. The most significant increase in activity followed the initial protest on the 15th of May during the week leading up to the 22nd of May elections. May the 27th was the eve of uh, the elections and the, the date of the 15th of May was chosen because it was one week before the, the elections. Now, Twitter was used, what these authors argue is that Twitter has been used not only in Spain, but in recent protests and mobilizations in other countries, uh, because it has a distinct advantage. It combines the global reach of broadcasters with local personalized relations. On Twitter, you can reciprocate, you can enter a dialogue, but you can also ignore that and just broadcast or narrowcast your messages it's an asymmetrical uh, network uh, platform as opposed to Facebook, uh, which until very recently was strictly symmetrical, although now, as you know, on Facebook, you can also follow people uh, in an asymmetrical relationship. They don't have to follow you back. Now, it's not just academics and hard scientists who are interested in, in Twitter. The, uh, the activists themselves have uh, singled out Twitter um, as, a, as a special platform. And I'm quoting two um, activists in Catalonia and Barcelona who say the following about Twitter. The face-to-face -face assemblies at each of the encampments are essential, not only for logistical reasons, but because within them, through the committees, both daily and midterm plans are laid out. They are primarily a massive, transparent exercise in direct democracy. However, the direction is created mostly on Twitter. Hashtags, these keywords, serve not only to organize the, de the debate, but also to set the collective mood. To give you an example, there was a case on the 27th of May in Barcelona, which you may have come across, of the Mossos de Squadra, the lo local police in Barcelona, beating up demonst peaceful demonstrators being beaten up. Uh, this created outrage, and that outpouring of, of emotive language was channeled through Twitter, but channeled in, in ways that led to further mobilizations um, and, and set the mood. Twitter has played, one of the roles Twitter has played has been in, a, in being a very quick uh, sounding board and, and, and a, uh, a platform where you could, um, in almost real time, set the tone, set the mood of, um, of the protest movement. Now, what, what happened after the Acampadas? Well, after about a month, the um, and very long, arduous assemblies debating the issue, 
demonstrators, uh, people had, those who had occupied, who were camping in, uh, in the main squares across Spain, decided not to give up, but to, as they put it, to relocate, to expand. The term used by uh, some of the um, activists was, we're not, we're not leaving, uh, we are expanding. So the, the protest moved to local neighbourhoods, assemblies were created in, uh, in many different neighbourhoods across Spain, from the central squares to the barrios. In my own neighborhood in Barcelona, in Poblanol, we had um, an, a local assembly that met on a weekly basis. And contrary to expectations, the movement continued throughout the summer. Quite a number of actions were undertaken throughout the summer. There were high-profile high profile actions covered by the media to defend, for example, vulnerable collectives like foreign immigrants and victims of evictions. No. But as I said earlier, the mainstream media attention was rather um, short-termed. It was, it was, it was. The uh, 15M certainly had entered the public discourse, but it was, it was on and off the uh, the public eye for for this period. Or it has been since then. And on the 15th of, t of October. A global protest was um, organized in um, nearly a thousand cities in 82 countries. Over here we're familiar with uh, the Occupy movement, which was directly inspired both by events in the, in the Arab world, but also by the Spanish uh, case. If you go to the Adbusters uh, website, they very clearly... Um, link it to the, to the Spanish um, Indignados movement, or the 15M movement, although the mainstream media in the US and in other countries haven't always um, uh, mentioned that the, there's been, uh, that link has been very unevenly, unevenly discussed in the mainstream media um, outside Spain. Now, I'm not sure you can read that, yeah, more or less. So this is one of the actions, local actions, to stop <coughs> families who can't keep up with their mortgage payments from being evicted. Uh, there are thousands of families affected by, by this situation. And the writer Millas uh, writes tongue-in-cheek, 15th of May has a strange collective and protean identity. It can materialize simultaneously in cities that are far apart. One thing that the movement has done very well has been, obviously in part through the, through the ability to use um, smartphones and uh, social media platforms, to very quickly organize uh, a so-called smart mob to uh, prevent an eviction and to... to undertake other forms of direct action. Uh, this is uh, a diagram of that collective day of action on um, the 15th, uh, 15th of October. It's not of the best quality, but it gives you an idea of uh, the almost viral spread of the movement from uh, September onwards. Okay. How are we doing for time? I guess you can wrap up in three, four minutes. Three, or four minutes. Yep. Yeah. Three, four minutes. So we can have some time for questions. Now, um, <coughs> the ethnographic approach to research, uh, as we know, entails participant observation. And I pointed out earlier that um, one of the uh, the advantages of this kind of research approach, approach or strategy, is that. Uh, it's very well suited to, to platforms uh, and media that are, are designed to encourage participation. Just to give you a couple of quick examples. Um, a few months ago, I was helping out with the translation of the manifesto, the Real Democracy Now! manifesto, into English, and I suggested on the Facebook group a couple of, um, of changes, of, of what I thought were improvements, 
But very quickly, within a few minutes, I was corrected by somebody else saying, well, yeah, I like that change, but I think that last line, that should, I, I, I would suggest this other translation. And there was a short, a brief exchange, um, and the issue was resolved very quickly. So Facebook has become one of the, uh, by no means the only, collaborative environment, but there are also uh, free, open um, source platforms that particularly those activists with a background in, in hacktivism and in, in hacker uh, activities um, are promoting. Uh, I'll give you an example from that. Uh, again, a few months ago, some activists in Barcelona were creating a directory of groups. This was before the 15th of uh, 15M protests. They were creating a directory of groups that may and platforms that may be interested in helping out with the uh, preparations for the, for the demos on the 15th of May. So, within a matter of hours, they set up a working group of 10 or 12 people. I joined that working group through a platform known as Pirate Pad, um, created by the uh, Swedish Pirate Party. And it's a very simple wiki on the left and the chat facility on the right. It's a very efficient way of sharing, of pooling information, in this case uh, mostly hyperlinks and brief comments on, on what the various groups were doing. It took us about two or three hours to do a job that would have taken me weeks to, to compile. Um, so there's more to this than the rhetoric of, um, of than dismissing the hype about participatory, um, participatory media. The, there are documented instances, in, uh, and, and this was quite prevalent throughout the whole process, of um, uh, people who didn't come from an activist background using platforms such as Facebook and then moving on perhaps to less familiar platforms to, to collaborate. Uh, folk categories, I haven't got much time for this. Uh, as part of my contribution to the movement, my very small contribution to the movement, and also to try and organize what um, became a, an enormous amount of disparate materials, um, I, I started uh, writing a, a 15M glossary, which became a sort of dictionary, by collect, collecting left, right, and center, and simply the old method of copying and pasting. At first, I was criticized for some of the entries, but my defense has always been, I'm, I'm referencing, I'm, I'm, just, I'm giving you the source, uh, and, and the idea is to collect the folk categories, the, the key concepts, the key words that, the, that are being um, generated from, the wind, or from within the movement, uh, including key concepts such as uh, la red, uh, network, uh, net, network. Red, redes, uh, redadas, enredos. Oh, there's also playing with, with the notion of, 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 of networks. It's one of the, 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 the key metaphors. Um, not so much community. Community to some extent, but not so much. But there's a, there's a, there's a vast uh, vocabulary that has been generated. And again, vast participation goes into uh, creating this new language. So I've got 30 seconds for ground up comparisons. Now, um, the, this is really, uh, for me, very early days of looking at other, other cases. I've got <coughs> enough on my plate with the Spanish case, but I'm going to try my best to, from now on, in the coming months, to, to look at, certainly to the Occupy movement, uh, but also to... Uh, the Arab Spring, and events in countries like Malaysia that uh, don't get as much um, global media coverage. Now, we look at the uprising in Egypt uh, in January 2011. What we find is that each stage of the conflict had its own unique blend of media, both old and new, analog and digital. From Twitter and Facebook to graffiti and leaflets through broadcast media such as radio and TV. So the same as in Spain, a whole host of different types of media uh, shaping the changing mediascape of uh, the protest. 
Social media appear to have been very important tools during the preparations and launch of the so-called Day of Anger on the 25th of January, but they, they were so alongside other technologies such as email, mobile phones, leaflets, television, and etc., including face-to-face -face communication. Later on, when Mubarak's government disrupted the, uh, when he shut down the internet and mobile services, other media came to the fore, including landline phones, ham radio, graffiti, with, I guess, but I'm not sure about this, television, well, most notably Al Jazeera, becoming um, even more important given the, the lack of access to, um, to internet and mobile services. When these services were re-established, the protest media escape was reconfigured again and continue to evolve from hour to hour, day to day. So these are very fast moving events where the mediascape changes uh, uh, very rapidly. And to, to conclude, Mark Peterson uh, commented by our, our mailing list, our media anthropology mailing list, he made the comment that because the media are so interconnected, each transformation in one sector requires some changes, minor or major, in others. Uh, so to conclude, one question that um, arises from this is why do various political actors use certain media and not others at different stages of, of, the, pro uh, of the process? Uh, one familiar term, affordances, could be useful here. Uh, Julian Hopkins uh, argues that Twitter is asynchronous, real-time, decentralized, and easily accessible, which makes it an ideal medium for spontaneous, decentralized protest. However, Twitter lacks the stamp of authority of older visual media such as television. The visual affordance, the, that possibility enabled by the technology of television and the history of the media, le uh, lends veracity to the protest, and give the protest this quality of being history in the making.